That's a common problem. We get so fixated on what we did because we had to pour our entire lives into it to stay competitive at the highest level. But once it's over, like you don't have to be stuck in that field. If you get out of the military, you don't have to be a contractor or work security or do something like that. Like you don't have to. You can do whatever you want. Same with sports, man. I think a lot of people get done being athletes. They're like, well, I have to do something around my sport because that's what I'm known for. That's all I understand. And it's not true. Whenever people say, I don't know what I'm into. I'm like, I'm BS, man. I don't believe you. <laughs> like, We all got things that we like to do or see or experience that are outside of our normal day-to-day -day routine that we're accustomed to, on the whether it's on the battlefield or the ball field. And so leaning into those things and, and checking those things out and not worrying about the fact that you're in your 30s or whatever you are. You can start these things at any stage in life. Hey, before you guys watch this video, I want to let you know that this is going to be audio only. Nate and I were having some technical difficulties, but I didn't want to reschedule. I wanted to make sure we just got that episode recorded. So it's audio only. You can click the links in the show notes if you'd rather just listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It may be better than you just sitting on YouTube watching an interview with no video. All right, I love you guys. Let's get into it. What's up, beautiful people? Welcome back to the Thrive After Sports podcast. You guys are in for a treat today. I just wrapped up my interview with Nate Boyer. I can't even begin to give you the bio of this man, so I'll do my best very quick, okay? He's a former Army Special Forces Green Beret, overall badass, walked on a university of Texas out here in Austin, ended up playing for the Seahawks for a few years, and then after he left the NFL, became an actor. The man is now an actor, director, and founder of MVP, which is Merging Vets and Players. You'll hear a lot more about that in the interview. Merging Vets and Players brings military veterans together with former athletes to work out together and just create a space where they can share their experiences of transition and support one another. Last year, Nate also released a movie called MVP, which is a story of, you guys need to go watch the trailer. I think what I'll do is I'll link the trailer in the show notes. You guys can go check that out first and then I'll have the links and then you can go look up the movie if you want to watch it. But it's a story of a military veteran crossing paths with a retired NFL player and they form a partnership and it just kind of shows how they form merging vets and players and some of the things they're doing. So I want to encourage you to visit vetsandplayers.org so you can check out the organization. And then like I said, in the show notes below, I'll have the links to the trailer so you can watch the movie. Before we get into the episode, I want to read you guys something that I think will really set the tone for the interview. Before I heard about MVP, uh, I wrote an article on LinkedIn that eventually became part of my book. Shameless plug, visit tajdashan.com to grab a copy of my first book, Thrive After Sports. Um, I wrote this article and I'll read it to you right now. So I wrote, I've often made the comparison between playing sports at an elite level and serving in the military. While the stakes are dramatically different, there's no denying the similarly structured lifestyles. Every day our attention is undivided and our roles are crystal clear. We are told when to report for duty or practice, when to wake up and when we can take the day off. This highly regimented, highly disciplined lifestyle becomes second nature to us. We grow accustomed to pushing ourselves beyond the limit and being comfortable with discomfort. The reason I wanted to read that is just because it's something that's been on my mind for a long time, which is why I was so excited to connect with Nate and why I was so excited about the movie Merging Vets and Players. And with that, we'll get into this episode with Nate Boyer. A couple of things I just wanted to, to share with you, and I'll give you a proper introduction when I record the intro to this because really I just wanted to utilize this time to have a conversation with you and yeah, yeah. my audience, just so you know, the people who listen to the show, it's based off of my business thrive after sports, where I help former athletes transition, mostly collegiate, but a lot of professional and Olympic athletes as well. So written a couple of books, I do coaching. Um, and obviously the podcast is an extension of that transition work, but I wanted to reach out to you because man, I heard about MVP. This had to be years ago when I was first getting started in 2018 and I was like man I'm gonna reach out to these guys one day but I'm like I gotta get my weight up because I had just I probably worked with like five athletes at that time and had just okay. started putting out content so long story short I was like I'll reach out when the time is right and then I just completely forgot about it and Denver Morris the director of outreach yeah reached out to me awesome guy um we ended up connecting on LinkedIn and he told me about the MVP movie which and by the way, all right, so for those listening right now, make sure you check the show notes. We'll have all the links down there. I don't want to jump the gun, Nate, but can you just please tell me before we really get into this interview, can you please tell people the best place to go check out that movie, MVP? Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Taj. Uh, I mean, it's streaming a lot of places right now, which is great. So there's a lot of options for folks. Most popular, it's on, I mean, it's on Amazon Prime, it's on Apple TV. Um, but also just recently Showtime licensed it. So Showtime has partners 
uh, if you don't have uh, the Showtime app or Showtime, you know, cable on your TV. Um, they also, there's packages within Paramount Plus, Hulu. Uh, I mean, it's kind of endless. So if you just, even if you just Google MVP the movie, you know, and look at that Google page of like where to watch, it'll give you all those options. But it's it's streaming everywhere. And beyond that, you can host screenings. People have been hosting screenings around the country. We actually have one coming up next week uh, down in Jacksonville on a on a, an old like navy ship the uss orlek um it's it's pretty cool so people have been organizing theirs as well so those are also an option um you know to to uh to figure out and uh, if you want to you know try to watch in a theater with a group of people but um but yeah you can stream it pretty much everywhere and also i, I do want to say uh go to please go to vetsandplayers.org i know we'll learn more about that in this conversation but um that's merging vets and players the uh charitable organization I co-founded uh, with Jay Glazer. And even through the website there, you can find out how to watch the movies uh, also. There it is. So folks, it's everywhere, like Nate said, but please just go to vetsandplayers.org. I want to get into your story a little bit, and we're definitely going to spend some time talking more about the movie and, and more about the organization as well. But you have a wild story, man. And I mean wild in a good way. I say that as a compliment, you know, from <laughs> Green Beret to walking on at University of Texas at 29 to play in the NFL. Now you're an you know, actor, director, uh, co-founder of Merging Vets and Players, like you mentioned. Uh, I want to start here, man. I don't want to just completely bypass your, your career in the military. I mean, I know you served. I think you had three deployments. One of them was two in Afghanistan, one in Iraq, correct? Um, yes, that make exactly. Sense? I went to Afghanistan a couple of times uh, in Iraq. Too. I went to Iraq first, and then later in my career, I went to Afghanistan twice. Okay. So first of all, thank you for your service. I oh, appreciate that, brother. <laughs> and I know that's a running joke in the movie. So I was I was hesitant <laughs> to say that, but I'm like, let me see how. No, he it's not. This, it's never <laughs> offensive, man. I, I hope people, you know, those that do watch the movie, you'll see what he's talking about. But uh, it's never offensive. It's just kind of, uh, it's just kind of a a, a funny thing because you know, some of us, at least for a, a period of time, there heard it quite a bit. And, it's interesting. You can, you can sometimes, uh, well, you can often decipher when it's not only genuine, but also, um, you know, when the person who's saying that doesn't feel like they're saying it out of obligation, you know, and then there's, there's other times where it's, it definitely feels that way. And it's, okay. it's still okay. You know, I know people are just trying to be polite, but it, it becomes, you know, like anything when it's, when something's kind of done a lot, uh, at times it becomes uh, less meaningful, but I'll say this, like we're lucky to have served in the time that we did. I mean, I think about like, you know, people that served during Vietnam, people that were drafted, they didn't even want to be in the military. Um, and then just came back and, and, and were disrespected and, and not treated, uh, you know, as, as, as people that were just following orders, trying to do their job the best they could and trying to serve, you know, and serve in their country. So uh, we're, we're fortunate in these times that people do say thank you for your service quite a bit. Uh, that's, that's a good thing, too. So I appreciate it, brother. Absolutely. I hope it was received genuinely, even though I made it a was, joke. Afterwards. It was. I really did mean it. <laughs> and uh, to your point, just a quick side note, you're you're you touched on something very important. My wife's father is actually a Vietnam vet. And that's a conversation that we have often just in terms of, you know, what it was like when he came back. You know, and so, um, right. but anyway, we could spend the whole episode on that. So thank you for your service. And, you know, I really, uh, I'm very curious about how you go from being a Green Beret to walking on at 29 at, at uh, University of Texas, man. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I, I grew up, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Grew up a huge 49ers fan. I mean, when I was a kid, we won, I think they, I think they won the first Super Bowl, like the year I was born. And then they won uh four others that i remember you know from my childhood and so i was lucky i was lucky to have <laughs> the a, a team you know where i was i grew up in el cerrito it's just across the bay from from san francisco uh kind of between berkeley and richmond and just lucky to have you know the the joe montana jerry rice ronnie lott roger craig dynasty uh when i was a kid so i had these guys that were my heroes and and I, and I played baseball and basketball and soccer and, you know, most every sport you could at a younger age. Um, back then, there, there was, I mean, youth football, at least in the Bay Area, wasn't as popular. Um, I don't even remember kids playing it. 
uh, until, you know, maybe middle school or so. So I didn't play when I was little. And by the time I got to like middle school, I remember being about 13 years old and thinking, you know, I'm watching these kids out at practice on the field, like I was probably in seventh grade or so. And I'm watching the football team practice out there. And I, I was a, kind of a late bloomer. So I was a little small and didn't have a ton of confidence. And just remember thinking, man, I, it'd be fun to play football, but you know, I'm prob I'm probably no good. And I'll end up riding the bench and, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I'll just skip it. So I didn't do it. And I get to high school and even more regret of not playing. Cause like I said, it's my favorite sport and, and I'm super into baseball and basketball. I loved them. Um, I was pretty good at baseball. I was okay at basketball, but basketball was my, was my favorite one that I played. So I just was like, well, if I do the football thing, I'll probably lose my starting spot or whatever. And, and just didn't do it. And it like stayed with me for, for a long time that, that like kind of childhood regret. So then I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 28 in the army, got a year left on my contract um, and decide to get out and go to college. Uh, and, and I started kind of training then I was, I was actually deployed to Iraq and I started the uh, training for uh football <laughs> in case I, you know, I get back and I get into college, get into, you know, and go try out for a team somewhere. And, uh, it was also at that time I ended up kind of picking the university of Texas. Uh, I mean, it sort of picked me in some ways too. I, I didn't grow up a Texas fan. I didn't care about Texas football. I mean, they were kind of the enemy. They were kind of the big, the bad guy, uh, because, you know, they're always good. And you know that it's a it's a big school and all this. You know they're they're rarely the underdog. Um, but that year in Iraq, this is in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, I'm deployed, and I'm watching the Texas football games and and then I heard about Coach Mac Brown and how he'd gone to uh, I think Iraq and Afghanistan on like a, a USO tour and visited the troops and I was just like, man, that's pretty cool. And it just, all the signs kind of pointed there. I remember seeing all the Texas flags um, and Texas like longhorn ball caps that, that veterans would wear, or I guess active duty people would wear overseas. Even in the movie, you see it in uh, American Sniper. Chris Kyle, you know, where's the Bradley Cooper who's playing Chris Kyle? Where's that Texas longhorn hat? It's like a thing, you know, it's just like a, there's a lot of veterans, army veterans anyway, from Texas. And, you know, it just was kind of like, the army's favorite team. It felt like, so <laughs> I just said, you know what, I'm going to go there. And I loved Austin. I'm in Austin right now, actually. It's a great city. Um, I thought it was a really good place for me to, as an older college student, go to school, you know, uh, in a new, new area that was very diverse and kind of, uh, a good sized city, but not huge. So it wasn't like a little college town, you know, where I'd feel kind of out of place being 10 years older than the other freshmen. And it all just sort of made sense. So I said, you know, what? I'm going to, when I get out, I'm going to, I'm going to go to Texas and I'm going to try out for the football team. That's wild. So you came in as a freshman at the age of 29. Um, yeah. Well, technically a sophomore because I took some online classes, but yes, I was a freshman. <laughs> I was a freshman on the football team. And uh, yeah, I just, I remember, I, I remember coming down here. Um, I got into, found out I got into school in like October or November. I was actually in Israel on like a training mission and my mom got a letter in the mail. She sent me an email saying, Hey, you know, with a picture of it saying, Hey, you got in congrats. And I was going to start that spring semester. So I came back from uh, Israel. We had like a, I was on a, a halo team. So we did, you know, free fall uh, jumping out of airplanes um, we had one more like, uh, you know, like a training mission doing that back in Arizona. This was in December. Um, and I'm out there, uh, you know, jumping out of planes and getting ready for college at the same time. And, <laughs> uh, and then when I, when I got done, my enlistment ended, I, I drove down to Austin from, I was stationed in Colorado Springs at the end of my career in the military and drove down to Austin, um, first day of school was like the next day and the first day of tryouts was the day after that i just like i checked into a like a motel six for like a month um because i didn't know anything about i mean i knew very little about the area i did a little bit of research but i didn't know anybody down here uh, i didn't have any contacts or anything like that and so 
I just stayed there for like a month and, um, you know, went to tryouts and ended up making a team and uh, eventually got an apartment <laughs> and, and moved in and, and <laughs> away we went. You know, it's it's so funny because I played with the guy. Uh, we called him Pops. He came in mm. as a 29 year old, uh, oh, really? I guess, junior. And so he had, you know, a couple years of eligibility and that's why we gave him the name Pops. You know, he was like, <laughs> he was an older guy to us and he seemed right. so old at the time. We made jokes about him having grown man strength, you know, and um, I'm not going to lie, Nate, you got me. I'm in Austin too. I moved out here from Southern California a couple of years ago. Uh, so I'm right up the street from UT. I have a year of eligibility left, man. You're giving me hope thinking I'm 31 now. I might mess around and go over there and see if I could play that last year. You might have to. You might have to. I just might have to. Uh, but back to your story, man, because it's so impressive that, I mean, you walked on and I mean, most people, when they walk on, they're just trying to get a scholarship. Like you walked on and ended up going to the Seahawks afterwards. That's why I say like your story is so wild, man. Can you just talk about how that came about, how you ended up, you know, going to the NFL? Yeah. You know, I mean, I was, uh, when I walked on, I walked on as a safety and I wasn't, I, I wasn't very fast. I, I, first of all, I never played the game, so that didn't help. But <laughs> I also like, you know, I was always a good athlete, but, but never a great athlete. I, I was just one of these people that, um, you know, I'd, I'd get like the coaches award, uh, for hustle. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, at the end of the right. season, like, you know, I, and, and I was like, like I was a six man on the basketball team and, you know, and, and I, I prided myself on that. I'd come in, I led the team in offensive rebounds and I'm like five, ten and a half. You know what I mean? That's I was right. like that, that kind of person, that kind of player, a good shooter, but like, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not breaking anybody's ankles out there. And, you know, I played, play TB, play smart team defense and all that kind of stuff on, on the basketball court. And same with baseball. I was like, I was first team all league, but it was utility because I was like, I pitched some, I played center field some, I played third base some, I played catcher some. It was like whatever the team needed, I was there, but it's not like I was the star shortstop on the team. So with that, you know, coming into football, I was like, well, with my size, you know, I'll probably be, you know, a safety or a, or like a slot receiver. That's the only thing that really makes sense. Um, and so I walked on, you know, playing as a safety, trying to get on special teams. And I struggled to even get, I mean, I was like the backup on the kickoff, backup uh, kickoff team, backup pump block team, but I couldn't get on the starting squad because I just didn't have this, I just didn't have the speed and the, you know, knowledge of the game and all that stuff. So um, I was, you know, working on that. But then my sophomore year, I was like, you know what? Um, I might as well start long snapping and just give that a go. People have mentioned it before because I had a pretty good arm. And, you know, I thought, well, I, I mean, I don't even know how to do it. I've never tried it. And uh, and then I realized the starter was a senior. The backup was a senior. So there was an opportunity there. I knew they were recruiting somebody to come in and do it too. But it's like, well, you know, I mean, worst case, I'm just not good at it, but I might as well try, you know? And, and so I did, I started snapping, ended up having kind of a knack for it. Um, worked on it for a couple of months, went overseas that summer. So that, that's another thing to note while I was in college, I, I re-enlisted in the Texas national guard. So I was still in the military and I would deploy in, in the summertime. So I would go overseas for about three, three or four months in the summer. Um, and, uh, so I started, uh, yeah, I started, I started snapping and I came back, uh, this, let's see what season was that? That would have been 2012 before the 2012 season came back from, uh, overseas and, um, and coach, you know, Mac Brown, let me try out for the position during training camp. And I ended up working my way all the way up to the set to the backup spot. So I'm on the travel squad, you know, I'm the backup long snapper. And the first game, the guy that was starting kind of didn't do so hot. So I got an opportunity and I ended up starting for three straight years uh, after that as the snapper um, for, you know, field goals, punts and extra points. And uh, 
Yeah, it carried me all the way through. I ended up getting invited to play in a senior all-star game. And, you know, it was from that senior all-star game that I kind of got the idea in my head that maybe I could try to play at the next level. You know, even though I was 34 years old, um, I was, you know, still, <laughs> I didn't get any taller. I'll say that. <laughs> you know, five, 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 10 and change. I weighed about 190 or so pounds when I played in college. And so I was pretty light for, a, for a, someone on the line, of course. So I start putting weight on some of the scouts there at that uh, Medal of Honor Bowl, which is that, that all-star game I played in. They were saying, hey, you, you should give it a go, but you got to put some weight on. So I gained about 30 pounds in maybe four months or so. It wasn't all good weight, but I was just trying <laughs> to pack it on so I wouldn't get bullied on the line. <laughs> and the draft rolls around. This is in uh, early May of 2015. And of course, I didn't get drafted. I wasn't expecting to, but I was just hoping to get a shot as a, you know, undrafted free agent. And once the draft ended, I got a call from, uh, um, I got a call from the Seahawks and I got a call from the St. Louis Rams. And I ended up picking Seattle because they'd been to back-to-back -back Super Bowls. Um, you know, that, that team from Marshawn Lynch to Richard Sherman and Russell Wilson and Bobby Wagner and Doug Baldwin, Jimmy Graham, Michael Bennett. But, uh, they just had endless – Bruce Irvin. So many good players, so many great players. K.J. Wright, like that whole – Cam Chancellor, I mean, think about him. You know, Earl Legion Thomas. of Boom. Yeah, you were there endless, with the squad. Man. It was endless. Tyler Lockett was a rookie. We were rookies together. Um, it was just like, this is this is awesome. You know, I gotta I gotta go for it. And so I went up there knowing it was gonna be tough. Um, but you know, I just kind of laid it all out on the line, and it, and it ended up uh, ended up working out just you know, going through the training, training camp play. I played one, only played one preseason game. Eventually I did get released, but to take it that far was, was really awesome. It was, uh, it was quite an experience, something I'll never forget. And, um, you know, it just get, gave me continued confidence to, uh, with, to, to help with that transition. You know, I know you're talking about transitions here, um, because I hadn't, I, when I transitioned, when I, when football ended, I had a, I had, I did have a scare there for a bit because I'd lost my Jersey and I also lost the camouflage um, from the military. I got out of the military in February of 2015 and I got released from the Seahawks in September of 2015. So in one year I went from both those locker rooms and, you know, missions and teams and, and all that stuff to, to none of those things. And uh, so I was like, dang, what do I do? What do I do? I kind of panicked thought about joining the military again, was trying to play maybe major league football, which was one of these spinoff leagues at the time. Um, and then that league ended up collapsing like most of them seem to do. And it was like, dang, dude, what do I do? And that's when uh, Jay Glazer and I, had, you know, he, he brought me the idea of, uh, of MVP, of merging vets and players, bringing these groups together, you know, that are helping – helping people that are in the same position I was in right then, you know, with that sort of indecision and worry about the future and feeling like you you've already peaked and your greatest days are behind you, you know? Um, Cause it's not true. It just feels that way because what we did were, were those two, those two things are seen as very important things, you know, and people really respect those uh, uh, professions, both being a professional athlete and, um, serving in the military and uh and when you're you know in, in those worlds you're pretty young when you re retire and so it was uh yeah it was it was tough but it ended up being um ended up working out in the sense of it gave me a few a a, a, a continued purpose and a way to 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 keep serving in some sense, you know what I mean? And, and doing something for more than just myself. Wow. I definitely want to stay on that point that you just brought up of finding ways to continue to serve and also doing it in a way, you know, making sure you have an impact on someone else, because it seems like from your experience, I'm sure you would agree with this. And I've seen this in my own life too. When you take your eyes off of yourself and find a way to be of service to others, a lot of that fulfillment and purpose, you know, it's obviously not the same as 
serving in the military or playing, you know, whatever your favorite sport is, but there's a different, almost the next level of purpose and fulfillment that you find through that. Um, and I think, you know, this might be a good time, Nate, for you to, <clears throat> for you to give some advice to those listening. Um, you had your own personal journey, but for those athletes tuning in right now who are either going to face that transition or are currently in the middle of it, trying to figure out what the hell they want to do next, who they are and are struggling. Is there anything that you can share with those people right now? I mean, I think the number one thing is like, don't try to do, don't try to do anything alone. And I, I'm, I'm the biggest violator of this. I'm always like, you know, I got this, I, I can handle it. I don't need help. I, I'll do it myself, you know? Um, and it just, it's not worth it. You know, there's plenty of people out there that want to help. They feel you're giving them an opportunity to feel purposeful by letting them help you out with something. And it can be as simple as like, if you're not feeling so hot or you're kind of confused about something or you're worried, you know, you got a lot, you got anxiety over the future or whatever, call up somebody in your world that you trust. It doesn't have to be a peer as far as your age or anything like that, but somebody that understands a little bit of your experience and go get a cup of coffee with them or grab them, grab a bite to eat or whatever, and just share it with them. Just be honest about it. Um, you know, and, and, and I mean, that's what MVP is all about. Yeah. We meet in the week on a weekly basis in the gym and we train together for about 45 minutes, you know, get a good, good workout in and then we'll huddle up afterwards and, and talk through, uh, stuff going on in our life in like a bigger group setting, you know? So usually it's 30, 40 people in there. Um, but it's an open forum and it's like no, no judgments I mean, people can, you can talk about anything. Um, we're there to listen and kind of help if somebody is struggling with something, you know, help them really work through it. Um, but beyond that, like it doesn't have to be within those walls. Like you, you can also, um, you know, do that stuff on your own time. I mean, we encourage MVPs 24 seven, like what we are and how we sort of uh, support one another. So I think that's the most important thing, man. Just don't try to do it alone. Just don't try to do this stuff alone. It's, it's not, it's not worth it. Um, and there's, like I said, there's just so many people that would, they'd love the opportunity to be of service to you and to help you out. Um, but also like, you know, just try things. If you don't know what you're into, like that's a common problem. I think these people, um, and I'm one of them. I mean, we get so fixated on our, on what we did because we had to pour our entire lives into it to stay um, competitive at the highest level, um, which I totally understand. But once it's over, like, you don't have to be stuck in that field. You don't have to, like, if you get out of the military, you don't have to be a contractor or work security or do something like that. Like you don't have to, um, you can do whatever you want. You know, you, you, the, it's an open book. Um, same with sports, man. I think a lot of people get done being athletes. They're like, well, I have to do something around my sport because that's what I'm known for. That's all I understand. And it's not true. Like you can translate those skills, transfer the, those skills into any facet of life because um, you know how to be a good teammate. You know how to sacrifice to be elite. You know how to work hard. You just got to learn a new thing. And the only way to learn the new thing is to try the new thing. So um, we've all got, you know, different interests. Whenever people say, I don't know what I'm into, I'm like, I'm BS, man. I don't believe you. <laughs> like we've right. all got something we're interested in. You know, we all got things that we'd like to uh, do or see or experience that are, that are outside of our, uh, you know, the normal day-to-day -day, uh, routine that we're accustomed to on the, whether it's on the battlefield or the ball field. And so leaning into those things and and checking those things out and not worrying about the fact that you're in your thirties or whatever you are. Um, and you feel like, Oh, it's too late for me to shift. That's, that's such a myth. It doesn't, it, it makes no, it, it does not matter. You can start these things at any stage in life. I mean, and any more people are working you know, well into their 60s, 70s, 80s these days. So like, there's a lot, there's plenty of time. There's a lot of time left. It's not like the old days where, you know, if you worked past 55, um, you know, that's old or whatever. Like that's not, that's not how, that's not how it is anymore. Less and less people are doing the full retirement thing. We're all kind of, we like to stay active and keep our minds active and, and continue to, you know, challenge ourselves. Yeah, that's I couldn't agree with you more. And I love the fact that you call BS when people tell you, you know, I don't know what else I'm interested in. And I was guilty of this, too. I was definitely one of those guys, 
you know, and I think it's because we don't spend the time. It's almost, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's pretty difficult while you're in the military, while you're playing a, a collegiate or professional sport to just have this crystal clear vision of your life. But when you're done playing to say, oh, I don't, you know, I have no idea. It's only because you haven't dedicated the time. And really all we have is time after we transition out <laughs> of the military, out of our sport. Exactly. Like you have time to cultivate that vision now, you know? I wanted to sh share this too, because you, you touched on something earlier that I think is really important. And it's one of the things that I respect most about MVP. You know, it's, it would be already great if you were just having, you know, veterans and, and athletes get together to work out. That's already great in and of itself. But having the extra component of creating space afterwards for people to open up and talk about what they've been through and support one another, that's the part that resonates with me the most. And, you know, I'm sure you would agree has the biggest impact. And then it's not only that, what you said was so important. It's it's not just within those walls, you know, of after the workout, it's encouraging people to stay in touch. You know, you said it's a 24 hour thing, which I think is beautiful. And you're really creating that community across, you know, the country, really across the globe um, for, for athletes to have the space to do that. So I, I did want to spend some more time talking about the movie MVP, yeah. you know, first of all, Props, you got some acting chops, man. Um, you just <laughs> before we talk about like I love I'd love to use this these last few minutes just for you to talk about the movie. But um, how did you even get into acting, man? I want to hear a little bit of that story as well. Well, you know, it was it was something that I, I was interested in filmmaking in general uh, back when I was 19. That's kind of when it first happened. I was I graduated high school. Like I said, I grew up in the Bay Area and then after high school, I moved down to San Diego. Um, a couple of my buddies were going to a firefighting school down there. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll do that. Like, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I moved down there. I started taking some fire, some fire science classes at a community college. Quickly realized that it just was like, not that it wasn't awesome and like very honorable work. I just felt like such a kid. I was like, man, I'm not ready to, this is a grown man's job. Like, I'm not ready to have that kind of responsibility. <laughs> um, and so I, I ended up dropping out and started working on a fishing boat. And I worked on a fishing boat for about a year down there. And I really liked it. Um, it was awesome just to get up, be outside. And like, you know, I enjoy being on the water and, you know, you know, it's blue collar, you know, man's work is what it felt like. I'm like, all right, this is how you become a man. Um, <laughs> but I also was like, I also saw, I could, I could, I could just knew this wasn't going to be my life forever. I'm like, I didn't know what I was really into or what world I wanted to work in. I mean, sports were my life. That was my favorite thing growing up. And when I didn't have an opportunity to play, um, at least I thought I didn't have an opportunity to play in college at the time. I was like, well, I, I don't really know what I'm, why, why would I go to college then? That's the only thing I like about school. <laughs> um, so I didn't do it. And, uh, and I'm there working on the boat and, ended up, you know, be inspired by a few movies I'd seen. All of a sudden I was like into it. You know, I started like researching and, and and watching more films. And like, I was like, dang, this is like something I can maybe see myself getting into. So uh, I moved up to LA and, you know, I, I actually lived, I lived out of my car for like five months. I didn't, I didn't have a play. I didn't have any money. I didn't have a place um, lined up. Once again, I didn't know anybody up there, just like moving to uh, San Diego and just like moving to Austin later. I mean, uh, so I, I just sort of, uh, rolled with it and, you know, got a job at a movie theater, eventually made enough to get, get a place. And then I started taking some, uh, acting classes and, um, you know, I was, was super into it. Um, I, I, about a year after I started taking the classes uh, is when 9-11 happened. So that definitely shifted my thinking. I didn't join the military right away, but it, it definitely got me thinking like, what else am I, what am I doing? Like what's, there's more important things in the world than this. And yes, I'm, I'm interested in this, but I don't even know how to genuinely pursue it. And I feel like I need to live my life a little bit first. Uh, so eventually I just, you know, joined the military and started and, and went into that. And, but it was something that stayed with me for those 12 years I was gone. Um, you know, of like, eventually I want to come back to this. This is something that uh, I, I'm, I'm passionate about. And I feel like 
there would be there, you know, this is a, there, there's a lot of opportunity in this career and there, and not just opportunity to work. I mean, like opportunity to, um, to help tell stories and bring light to situations. And it's a very powerful medium. It's maybe the most powerful medium in the world. Um, and to be a part of that storytelling process was just very appealing to me. And, and also from the acting side, like an opportunity to, to, to be somebody else for a little while or experience some different things. I feel less of that need now, but when I was in my early twenties, I didn't really like who I was. And it was like, this is an escape for me. You know what I mean? I can, I can pretend to be somebody else or something else. And that was, that was the initial appeal. Wow. Cause I mean, like, yeah. I was impressed, man. I watched the movie and I'm like, damn, this guy can actually really act. Like I believed your character, you know, um, sometimes you watch things and it's hard to like buy into the character, which makes the overall experience of the movie less real. But right. uh, I thought the movie was phenomenal. I'm grateful for, for, to Denver Morris for sharing that with me. And can you just talk a little bit about what the MVP movie is and what people can expect from it? Yeah, I'm grateful to Denver too, man. I mean, Denver's done a lot for really building MVP. He started out in LA and then he eventually moved to Dallas and opened that chapter. So um, always appreciate you, brother. But you know, the, the MVP movie, it's based on the, the genesis of how the organization started. Um, you know, it's not, it's not, hundred percent like based on the you know the, the true story as far as the actual way it all occurred but pretty close all the people in the film all the characters are based on real people like even the zephyr character he's a composite um of a couple of uh, uh veterans that were part of uh mvp you know and and uh, that zephyr character and and, and you know and some of denver's backstory um helped sort of shape that character Denver was in two seven, um, just like uh, Zephyr was in two seven, the Marine Corps battalion uh, that took heavy casualties on back to back deployments, and then has lost quite a few men to suicide since then, since returning home. And you know that story, like I knew I wanted to direct a movie, I wanted to um, create a, a story that was told by us, the veteran community, and also the athlete community. So I wanted to have real people in it, real people behind the camera making it. Um, not not that not that filmmakers aren't real people, but I mean, <laughs> I mean like people right. that have actually lived these lives, experienced these things. So like every veteran portrayed on screen is played by an actual veteran. And then you've got you know Randy Couture and Tony Gonzalez, Michael Strahan and Howie Long have a cameo in there. Jay Glazer, um, Jared Bunch, an NFL player. Uh, you know, all these guys, uh, Jay Huron even has a cameo, a, a UFC, another UFC fighter. All these people, uh, they were real pro athletes or real veterans and really came to MVP, you know, and kind of shared about this stuff at some point in their uh, journey. And I asked them to come back and be in the movie and play themselves and kind of retell those stories. Um, and they're still acting, of course, because it's, you know, it's a narrative feature. It's not a it's not a documentary, but I wanted it to feel kind of like one where it was like, this is real. This is raw. Same with all the vets. When the vets are telling their stories and talking, like all those people, they're all real veterans. Um, and they experience a lot of those things personally, or at least people they served with are kind of going through those things or, or, you know, have suffered some great loss like that. So I just wanted it to feel very authentic and genuine. And, and the only way to for me to feel like I was doing that and justifying that was to have the real people be in it, you know? Um, so that's how I cast it. And that's how it was sort of written. Um, it was written with the idea of when, the, when these people go come on camera and talk about their journey, I'm like, all right, don't worry about the script anymore. Don't worry about the words that are written. You just tell me your story. You know, tell me this, tell me, retell me this story as if it's the first time you're telling it and talk to these people in the room right now, as if we're in an MVP session. And that's what they did. So, um, so that definitely helped. And, and, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges of the whole thing was for me was the acting portion. Cause I also was, I was directing it. I was producing it. Um, so I had all of this other stuff going on behind the camera that no one sees. Um, and that was, it was challenging to, to be able to perform up there, but I'm very grateful to have Mo McRae who played Will Phillips, uh, Dina Shihabi, 
uh, who played Emmy, uh, Christina Ochoa, who played Moma, or excuse me, Will Phillips' wife, Tracy Phillips. Um, these very like uh, talented, but also hardworking and generous actors who gave a lot of their time because no one was making a lot of money on this movie. Um, to help me through that, you know, and to help me on camera as well. Um, but also just to give me some, uh, uh, some peace of mind knowing that like, these are absolute pros uh, and they're going to crush it. You know, Tom Arnold too, you know, I mean, he came in uh, just for one day on it to, to shoot some stuff. And he was amazing. You know, he was awesome. Dan Loria, who plays the barracks administrator. He's a real, he's a Vietnam veteran. And he, he was the dad on the wonder years for some of the older audience members like myself that remember that show. <laughs> but anyway, like all these people just brought it, you know, and it really helped make this thing uh, good. It's, it's good. And I'm proud of it. Man, I would, I would say it's much better than good. It's fantastic. And mission accomplished on the authenticity piece. You know, I think you did a great job of, and I know bringing in the actual players and actual veterans was a part of that. Um, but overall, the script, just the movie itself, there were times where I got emotional. And for anybody tuning in, this is a must watch. I'm not sure how many veterans listen to this show, but for all you current and former athletes, this is a must watch. Um, you will feel very understood about your experience uh, when you watch this movie is the best thing I can say about it. Um, Nate, thank you so much, man, for coming on. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, folks, go check out that movie. Like Nate said, it's everywhere. I'll have some links in the show notes, but all you got to do is, you know, Google MVP. MVP movie. If you see Nate's face on the cover, uh, then you found the right movie. And um, I want to encourage everybody to go check that out. It made a huge impact on me. So Nate, thank you again for your time today. And just thank you for all that you do in the world, man. I appreciate you. Of course. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate you having me on, brother. Hey, so if you made it to the end of this episode, first of all, thank you for tuning in. For those of you guys who are here for the first time, welcome. Please like the video if you're watching on YouTube and subscribe to this channel. I have a lot more great interviews coming up. I think you'll really be surprised with some of the guests that I have and some of the stories that they have to share. This is important work. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please just leave a five-star review, subscribe, and share this episode or any other episodes out with someone who needs to hear it. I am on a mission to help as many athletes transition out of their sport and have successful lives after their careers and not just survive, but thrive in everything that they do. And you guys know I do that in a myriad of ways. It's not just the podcast, it's not just the books. But I do offer coaching as well. I want to encourage you guys to go back and look at some of the testimonials of former athletes that I've worked with to help them through their transitions. Guys, don't hesitate to reach out. Visit TajDeshaun.com. That's where you can find all the free resources, not just the podcast and the books, but access to me. You can schedule a free call with me. I'm not going to get on that call and try to sell you on buying the group program. I have a ton of free access and scholarships for athletes to work with me. So utilize those resources, guys. And last but not least, I definitely want to encourage you guys to grab my first book, Thrive After Sports. You can just go on Amazon, type in Taj Deshaun. Uh, I have multiple books on there, but I always try to point people to Thrive After Sports just because I think that's the, the book that I look at as the most impactful that can help an athlete through the transition. I know a lot of people have read that book and been helped through the transition without ever having to speak to me or even listening to my podcast. And I just got this recording today that I want to share with you guys from my guy, Benjamin Van Buren. He's a soccer player, former soccer player at Mercy College, uh, went on to play professional soccer and just recently retired. And he read my book while he was playing, but then read it again after he retired. And this is what he had to say about it. I love you guys. I'll see you in the next episode. Peace. And here's Ben. Yo, Taj is Ben from Athlete Mentor. Um, just want to let you know, obviously your book came in and I read it a while ago um, when I was still in season and it didn't really hit me then. I was like, yeah, cool. It's a, it's a great book, whatever. And then I went to Spain and I was playing for a team over there and then I left because my grandmother was sick, uh, so I came home and now it's hitting me. So I read it again. Dude, that thing is phenomenal. Like if you could put this audio on a case study on your website, I would do it because it's crazy how like the skills and attributes that student athletes have just go, they just go missing. And it's like, yeah, you're playing sports, you have all this adrenaline, all this, all this hype about you all you're working out all the time you feel good and then out of nowhere it's like oh cool i'm done you know like i know nothing to work for really so then you get into sales you get into other things and you find something that you want to build for yourself and that's what you get that that uh that excitement and that adrenaline from again so yeah man i just want to let you know that i read it again and it really hit me now that i'm kind of officially retired as a player player but um yeah that's uh 
So I wanted to say, man, I hope you're doing well. Hope you're living the life. I'm actually on Long Island now. I'm going to go to Stony Brook basketball game. So at your alma mater. But uh, yeah, dude, uh, phenomenal work. And uh, let's, let's obviously stay in touch. Maybe get on a call soon. Talk to you later. Peace.